If you remember the last slide, one of the uh, hexagons, there was also the nuclear uh, power generation, the small modular power generators. Not only gas is part of the uh, reasons, of the roots of our today's crisis. In the media they don't speak much about that, but the truth is that in France, which basically depends on nuclear power generation, they have currently a number of uh, nuclear power plants um, on the standby regime because they uh, are doing the maintenance. Let us see whether the nuclear power generation can be uh, the solution and uh, to what extent it is good for the base load, for the uh, basic coverage of the or, or, or input in the energy portfolio in various countries. But let us see what it means if some of the sources is uh, um, eliminated for one or another reason. Uh, are there any other technological solutions which would be based on uh, the nuclear power generation but which could work in a different mode? There will be another guest to our conference. It is Dana Drabova and it's my great honor to extend my very cordial welcome to her. She came with the, with the answers. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Can nuclear energy production be a part of the change? Is for nuclear power production the current situation very tense on the market with energy communities? Is it a threat or an opportunity? My belief is, and I will try to demonstrate it to you, that for nuclear energy it's a big opportunity. But let's start in a larger context, my predecessor mentioned a so-called energy trilemma, which means a permanent search for balance between energy safety, I mean energy supplies safety, meaning that we have uh, supply, energy supplies or any other commodities uh, available at the right time on the right place and in the right quantity. The second uh, climax of the triangle is economic one, price affordability. And the third one is sustainability towards uh, human beings, towards environment. We will show that all climaxes of this triangle are very closely interconnected and sustainability and it has been already indicated, is sometimes presented as reducing GHG emissions primarily, I mean reducing the impact of human beings on climate. But sustainability is very closely connected with the supply safety and with price availability or affordability as well. But let me focus rather on the supply safety because sustainably, as defined by, for instance, Green Deal, is for me more reducing the human's impact on client. What is principal in there is reducing dependence of Europe on fossil fuels. Europe doesn't have these fuels on its territory and is continuing importing them from countries with a regime that are not nice regimes. Let me show what was the situation in 2020 and let me speak about electricity, which sometimes is called petroleum or oil of the 21st century, very specific commodity. What was the situation in 2020 concerning electricity cover in terms of a portfolio of different power plants. We have fossil power plants, we have nuclear power plants, and we have three ES power plants in which uh, not wind power plants not or photovoltaic power plants play the major role, but 
water power plants play the major role. Using fossil sources is typical mainly for Poland. 80% of their power plants uh, consume mainly domestic Polish lignite. As completed with renewable resources, I would say not the intermittent ones, but rather permanent ones, because they are based on water, although also the climatic dependence is shown there. Let me mention also Japan, that after the tragedy of uh, Fukushima power, nuclear power plant in 2011, uh, operated 53 nuclear blocks covering 30% of uh, electricity consumption of Japan. These nuclear power plants have not been re commissioned, they were all shut down in 2011, and Japan has to substitute their loss of production by importing LNG. And if somebody thinks that electricity is expensive in Europe, I recommend such a person to visit Japan for comparison. In terms of the worldwide average, admitting that every average is something tricky, the world relied on coal and uh, natural gas by 60%. In 2020, by 10%, it was uh, nuclear power plants producing uh, uh, and 20% there were VS with the predominance of water power plants. Let's have a look at the countries that are sort of both similar to each other and not similar to each other in terms of low emission electricity production. The Czech Republic in 2020 relied on fossil fuels, mainly on uh, domestic coal, but also by 10% on uh, natural gas by 50%, 30% of our demand was covered by nuclear power plants and 13% by renewable resources. Germany has a bit lower part of fossil fuels in energy production, however, much higher part of, I would say now, intermittent RES because it is, they are mainly wind power plants in the Baltic and Northern Seas. However, if we look at low emission electroenergy, we can see that Germany and the Czech Republic are quite similar to each other. We are not very much behind Germany. Just the proportion is reverse. We rely more on nuclear power production, while Germany relies mainly on wind power plants. And now a couple of countries that, from the point of view of the Green Deal or net zero strategy, have fulfilled their obligations. France, with enormous proportion of nuclear energy, around 70%, quite a lot of yes, uh, so that uh, a very small percentage is covered by fossil, fossil fuels. France, and more generally Europe, is paying price for that, because due to weather, especially dry weather that is currently quite successfully compensated by cooling systems in France for nuclear power plants, there is now more water uh, supply than in the past. But what is important are service maintenance, service repairs, that in the time of COVID pandemic were sort of neglected, let me say so, not in terms of the overall safety, but they must, we must be more, uh, they must be done more intensively. 
the production, 19 gigawatts, uh, uh, the loss is uh, equal to the production capacity of the Czech Republic. And uh, France is sort of uh, contributing to high prices of electricity in Europe, not by a small part. Two more countries, Sweden fulfilled the low emission demands, non-fossil energy with uh, its many water plants, many wind plants and roughly 30 percent of nuclear plants. And the country that uh, fulfilled completely is Norway with 98 more uh, production uh, covered by water supplies. If our father uh, Czech didn't stop only in the Czech basin, we would be better off. In 2021, 19.5% of the final energy consumed was electricity. In the world, 27,000 terawatt hours of electricity were produced. The Czech Republic produces the, something as 10 terawatts. So no, we are not a significant producer. Nuclear power plants, another drop in their uh, contribution from 10 percent to 9.8 percent in 2021, which has not been due to the to sh some massive shutdowns of nuclear power plants or lesser production. It was rather due to an increase of production in other power plants in mainly developing countries, and these are mainly either water or coal power plants. Nuclear power plants, in terms of sustainability, if we imagine it as redu reducing GAG emissions, contribute a lot. We can see that between uh, uh, 1970 till 2018, they helped to save some 80 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. The second biggest contributor in this respect were already mentioned several times, water power plants. And all that together has uh, it's second sign, reducing consumption of fossil fuels. For illustration of that, we can watch how much in 2020 low emission fossil, uh, uh, not fossil, excuse me, sources contributed. Hydro resources were predominant, and nuclear went, photovoltaics, the geo thermal bioenergy, the geothermal energy. Very often we can hear that the wind power plants uh, uh, grow very dynamically. That's true, but we should add that the basic uh, benchmark was very low. Therefore, even though they grow massively, uh, they still, still do not contribute massively to redu reduction of, or to increase of low emission energy. Nuclear power sector and uh, its further possibilities. They relay in the fact that uh, the purpose of it will not be only as a source of electricity and only partially a source of heat production as big. Uh, uh, generators of 1,000 megawatts installed are able of. More and more micro uh, generators are mentioned below 50 megawatts of electricity. They will be used for the so-called micro grids or even for off-grid electricity production. And the countries that are most interested in it, who would say uh, that they are Canada and Russia. 
because they need to supply their communities laying in the north and they have limited possibilities of extraction and, and they need so energy sources that would ne not necessitate to being connected with a grid. So one of the big partners for the Czech Republic in terms of micro reactors and micro generators below 50 or rather from uh, 50 to 300 a promising partner in this field will be for sure Canada there will be for sure the United States Korea South Korea and some other countries including France that is also applying for activities in this sector of small reactors. France is a little bit lag, lag, lagging behind, but uh, it's obvious that uh, the delay will be uh, caught up. So we said that uh, nowadays uh, nuclear power plants uh, you uh, are mostly used uh, for the basic load and in the future we will combine the huge reactors which are moderated by light water with pressure or without we will combine small reactors with the output up to 300 megawatts and the micro reactors and uh, this combination will make it possible for us to use the heat and electricity produced by these reactors of various outputs for new chemical uh, processes for purification of water for the generation of hydrogen and for many other industrial applications we will speak about them later what is important is that this combination will make it possible for us as long as we have a good way of stocking uh, the energy generated by the renewables over a substantially uh, long period of time at a reasonable price. Uh, the small reactors and uh, the renewables or the, uh, the intermittent resources will coexist quite well, much better than today. So this is something which is only starting to develop. The using the heat which is generated in a nuclear reactor for not just generating steam and subsequently electricity, but also for a number of chemical processes like, for instance, methane production or electrolysis or generation of synthetic fuels and subsequent uh, generation of hydrogen and uh, that can be used by many industrial areas. These products, that is electricity, hydrogen and synthetic fuels can be used by many productions as you can see and you can see that this really is a huge opportunity where we will use nuclear reactors. For small reactors, we speak about them quite a lot and they will certainly be a part of the solution. They are a great opportunity. However, for the time being, in the civilian operation, they don't seem to be many across the world. It is different for the military equipments especially for submarines or, <clears throat> or uh, uh, ships. You can see that they have uh, something in Pakistan and in China that was a pilot project uh, many years ago. Then we have the uh, heavy water moderated reactor in India. Then we have uh, the floating generation unit uh, in Russia. Akademishin Lomonosov and uh, others in Russia again. Currently four more are being constructed, each of them being somewhat different. 
There is even a place in Argentina, and it's been in construction since 25 years, but it should soon be put in operation. ACT 100, uh, one in China, Linglong one is interesting. In June, I went to Vienna where we had a meeting and we spoke about harmonization and standardization of small reactors and our Chinese colleagues were watching us in a strange uh, way as uh, meaning that uh, we would be uh, coining uh, the rules and they will be uh, putting them in practice. Well, China is an unpleasant partner if we uh, see if we take the geopolitical perspective. However, in technology, in the uh, technological area, they are the uh, world uh, leader, especially in high tech. And there are numbers of projects which could serve in Czechia as well within, let's say, 10 or 15 years. They could be pilot projects, they could be complementary to the large reactors which in the uh, which before the first before before uh, 2050 will be uh, the uh, main pole of uh, electrical energy generation. Seven of these projects have been selected which in 10 or 15 years could be built or put in operation. Certainly there will be a further shortlisting. What is the most advanced for the time being, and they focused on it in Canada in particular, they have the permit, permit uh, uh, building permit is Beverex 300, that is a nuclear reactor with uh, uh, with the uh, 300 kilowatts uh, output, 300 megawatts output. Sorry, uh, Canada needs these reactors. This one is not quite small, is it? 300 megawatts is not so small. Let us imagine that the Dukovany. Uh, nuclear power plants had the nominal output 440 uh, megawatts, that's the original output, or the formerly planned output. So, uh, the Canadian operator in Darlington should be prepared uh, uh, to put uh, uh, the unit in operation in uh, 2028, that's quite soon. One of the last uh, graphs which I want to show to you reminds us that uh, the uh, nuclear uh, power generation is a great opportunity. We could see a large scale of, of uh, uh, possibilities uh, which could be uh, of use to us, but it is highly controversial and uh, it will remain so for a very long time ahead unless the uh, energy famine convinces us that uh, uh, the disadvantages uh, are outweighed by uh, advantages and that the risks which are associated with nuclear uh, generators, whatever the size, is really uh, uh, outweighed by the benefits. This is a picture that shows, or the figure that shows, the reasons for uh, for staving off of uh, nuclear power plants. As you can see, there have been many reasons for uh, putting them out of operation, and you can see that the prevailing reasons where the public opinion, uh, the social situation and uh, the government's reactions. So there are 30 reactors, most of them in Germany, were staved off for purely political reasons. There was not a single uh, technical issue. The other group, 
is a group which reflects the variations on the markets with electricity, so that the reasons are economic, as a result of which the existing reactors after, let's say, 50 years of um, operation, which is LTO, long-term operation, so after those 50 years, it doesn't pay off any longer. You can also see that nuclear accidents were a really marginal cause for staving off the nuclear power generation capacity, and that was mostly in Japan. So, we, what we have to do is to start uh, working on innovative and flexible solutions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. What pops up in my mind are two or three uh, areas of questions. The first of them is associated with uh, safety, security. Uh, Russians are now bombarding nuclear power plants and uh, people sort of panic, uh, they are afraid of the, uh, uh, of the consequences of the pollution, nuclear pollution. So there are the safety and security issues, but I just wonder about those modular reactors, the fuel, is it the same as for the large ones? Yes, for the time being, however, many of the projects which so far only exist in theory or on paper or which have advanced to a certain degree in the development will have an innovative, uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, types of fuels in the form of uh, pellets or something like that which will be introduced in the reactors. However, the output as I said, of those micro or modular or mobile power plants is not very strong, but not very big. However, uh, there are tendencies to extend the mean time between uh, repairs, and it is also a likelihood of uh, using a highly enriched uh, fuel, which again would extend the period between the uh, the exchange of the of the fuel in the power generating units. So, for the time being, what we have to do with is the minimized version or, or reduced uh, versions of the existing systems. But in the future, there will be micro reactors, and uh, they will certainly work with new types of fuel. I read somewhere that they might be also able to work with the used uh, fuel from the traditional power generation units. I think that this is uh, a bit of uh, uh, sci-fi, not before long. However, there can be some reactors which will work with the fission of not not only uh, 235 uranium but also 238 uh, uranium and these will produce uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 waste which will be reusable there are also fast reactors where fission occurs as a result of the uh, uh, of the action of the fast neutrons, and that works in Russia, for instance, but it's never been able to generate for more fuel. Then, in 2016, they uh, 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 launched uh, in operation uh, the reactor which is called as the multiplication reactor, but nobody has seen it. I also spoke about uh, the uh, safety, meaning not just the safety of the deliveries. I mean, 
No, not security, but uh, safety of deliveries. Uh, will it always work? Shall we find ourselves in a situation like uh, uh, the one which we are now facing in the context of gas? So, is there any possibility to take the fuel or get the fuel from some other source than Russia? Yes, of course. For Temelin, we've already signed a contract for the fuel deliveries uh, uh, with Westinghouse and with Fratom. And uh, the diversification of the uh, of the fuel supply is very di uh, very desirable. The Czech Republic is buying its enriched uranium on the world markets. It's not that Russia delivers it. On the contrary, we deliver uranium to Russia to have it enriched, to have it uh, turned into the fuel form and they return it back. The diversification, because Canada, Australia, Kazakhstan, Mongolia and others are uh, huge exporters and I think that such a diversification would, would be much more pleasant than the diversification of gas, for instance. Yet another question. You enumerated the projects either in running or in preparation of many reactors and I noticed there were many more producers than normally uh, indicated uh, in connection with uh, finishing the con reconstruction of Temelin. Normally three are mentioned but for uh, global sources sometimes people say there are not enough of them. At first sight, it may be good, it may seem good if there are more producers, but on the other hand, there may be a risk that the one who produces should be certified and we should avoid that there would be dangerous reactors produced. Each of those projects uh, launched to be launched uh, at the market will be uh, supplied with the license of uh, the country of origin, uh, or, uh, provided there is an uh, investor found uh, uh, willing to build it up. So, from the design of uh, the reactor until there is a construction yard for constructing the reactor, and Mr. Toplanek mentioned that, uh, will involve quite a rigid structure of approval that will end up with no chance that something that would not meet state-of-the-art uh, nuclear safety requirements uh, would get to the market. When can we expect something like that in the Czech Republic? Is any project prepared? In September, it was approved that the establishment of the so-called South Bohemia Nuclear Park, uh, which is a social agreement between the South Bohemia region and the Institute of uh, Nuclear Safety, Rzeš, and this agreement is supposed to prepare a pilot project of a small 160 until 300 megawatts reactor. The project is very ambitious. In 2032, it should be finished before Dukovany Block 3. Uh, and uh, even if the deadline is not met, the project seems so ambitious that uh, it's very promising. I wanted to ask what's the difference between time of construction, for instance, uh, in the in green Greece, where we as our company are active, the, it took 20 years. Not, it would not, it should not be 20 years. It was 15 years, in fact. Well, the first reactors, it may take between five to seven uh, years because uh, obviously there will be new phenomena that will have to be treated, solved. But the time of construction planned is between three to five years if the type of the reactor is a repetitive one. It can be prepared in a factory 
Yes, that's the reason why it's sometimes called modular scheme, because there will be modules produced in a manufacturing factory and the modules will then be transported to the locations. American Westinghouse is quite experienced in this respect for their Chinese projects, very successful projects. Uh, they prepared many such modules and uh, many of them had been manufactured in a factory. The very last question for me, you mentioned the project for Temelin. Will there be participation of Czech companies? We have quite good Czech companies. I think that if a Czech company, excuse me, for the, the expression is good at, they may uh, be used at any market and if the price is reasonable and the quality is top level uh, why not so it's rather up to Czech companies to apply for their participation thank you very much for both the presentation and answers